good evening uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome once again to the last session today uh, we indeed had a very interesting uh, previous session uh, so now we are on to the concluding session of the day so without uh, much ado let me just uh, say some brief words of introduction about ay's marshal asutosh dikshit vice president medal vishesh uh, seva medal and assistant chief of the air, air staff plans so he is a fighter pilot a very accomplished fighter pilot with over 3300 hours of experience and he is an experimental test pilot and a qualified flying instructor as well who was actively involved in operation safed sagar operation rakshak uh, cope india and so forth and he has served as a directing staff at the air force test pilot school and as a principal director asr a staff requirements at the air headquarters and he's commanded number 9 squadron and the frontline fighter air base at uttarlai as well as at bidar and he has served as air defense commander southern air command and as acs projects before assuming the present appointment over to you uh, a marshal dikshit sir thank you very much sir uh, for your kind words sir today now uh, without uh, any further uh, discussion sir uh, we are entering this uh, very important chapter or session of uh, this seminar which relates to flight and naval simulators uh, now uh, i think people should be aware recently ministry has released a simulator policy Uh, headquarter ideas had is clear he did that and that has laid down the requirements that with every procurement there will be a simulator whether it is a by any service procurement from any service a simulator should be part of that now as far as air force is concerned simulators uh, make very important part of our training with almost all the fleets which we have today we have simulators those are flying simulators and for fighter aircraft helicopters transport similarly navy has simulators which are uh, ship simulators now importance of simulators everybody understands we are now looking to go down to further level that is we are also interested in a part task trainers where a particular area of the mission i can practice similarly we are also looking at maintenance simulators we have done some procurement of maintenance simulators because uh, with the aircraft resources getting more and more uh, costlier it is very important they may be maintained also very correctly so for that training uh, there are simulators there are technologies ar based technologies vr based technologies being developed we have looked at some of them and that is another area which is emerging right now some we have procured and some maintenance trainers we will be procuring so okay so uh, first speaker is from maintenance branch of uh, air headquarter group captain rajnish kumar uh, he is a director of uh, what we call dams directorate of uh, uh, maintenance systems aviation and maintenance systems they are the ones who are in charge of maintaining all the simulator devices which are held with indian air force so uh, i will i will now request uh, group captain rajesh kumar to deliver his talk yeah fine now is clear So before I commence my presentation on flight and non-flight simulators in the Indian Air Force, I would like to put up a pretty obvious statement. Statistics show that most accidents in military aviation occur during training flying, which is rather obvious and logical, considering that the learning curve for pilots is the steepest during training, whether it is ab initio training. or operational or mission training or conversion training which draws me to an analogy which i would like to draw between two of the most admired professions of our times that is pilots and actors 
If flight time for pilots is like camera time for actors, then simulator flying by pilot is like a rehearsal for actor. That analogy drives home the point as to how simulator flying is intertwined with pilot training in the Air Force, or for that matter, training of any combat crew. With that in the background, the scope of my presentation is as follows. Brief introduction to simulators as we in IF understand it, followed by a rundown on broad spectrum of utilization of simulators in the IF. I shall then provide glimpses of some simulators available with the IF and the simulator maintenance philosophy. We shall then have a look at few of the exciting simulator projects we have in the pipeline. In conclusion, I shall cover the challenges in operating and maintaining simulators as also the plethora of opportunities offered to the industry in the field of simulators. A flight simulator by definition is a device that artificially recreates aircraft flight and the environment in which it flies for pilot training, design or other purposes. As simple as that. In the types of flight simulators, the first type is the cockpit procedure trainer, the CPT as we call it. As the name suggests, it is a very basic simulator for the pilot to practice cockpit procedures like engine startup, taxi, ground run and engine shutdown, etc. The next in the hierarchy is the part task trainer, which is a little advanced than the CPT and caters for training for taxi of aircraft, takeoff, circuit flying and landing. That is mainly for honing the psychomotor skills of the pilot. The next type of simulator in the ladder is the flight training device, which is called FTD in the UK parlance, or more commonly known as the full mission simulator, which provides for simulation of full mission, including armament training, uh, as well as full mission capabilities. The highest level of simulator, however, is the full flight simulator, commonly called as FFS, which provides for motion simulation as well. The full mission simulator or the FTD caters for very limited motion simulator, maybe to the extent of just G, uh, the G4 simulation on the seat. The levels of flight, full flight simulators, FFS, from level A to level D. Level D is three axis motion, basically along the three uh, rotational axis of the aircraft, roll, pitch and yaw, with day and night uh, visuals. Level B, three axis motion, day and night visuals, with some ground handling simulation. However, as we move up, level C is the six axis motion simulation, which caters for three translational axis as well as the three uh, rotational axis, the conventional roll, pitch and yaw simulation, day and night and dusk visuals with dynamic control loading to give the pilot a feel, a realistic feel of loading of the controls. And it provides a very higher level of fidelity compared to the level A and B. The level D is the uh, the most advanced version of the flight, uh, uh, full flight simulators has six axis motion, like the level C simulator, has day and night and dust visuals, dynamic control loading, and the highest level of fidelity. This simulator provides for ZFT training, which is basically zero flight time training. We in the IF uh, utilize the ZFT concept with a bit of adaptation to the specific type of fleet. With a brief introduction, I shall now move on to the broad spectrum of utilization of simulators in the IF. Simulators in the IF are used to train both combat crew and combat support crew. The transition from glider flying to subsonic flights on trainer aircraft to sub supersonic speeds on fighter aircraft can be really challenging. So the IF adopts a step ladder approach while designing 
simulator training syllabus for pilots starts with ab initio training followed by role oriented training and advanced training i shall cover each of them in sequence starting with ab initio training the initial entry level pilots have got some or nil experience on glider flying so trainees are required to conduct basic simulator flying before they commence uh, flying training to the extent of around 15 to 20% of the initial training is uh, on the simulators and the rest is on the actual aircraft flying training syllabus have been revised with induction of high and medium fidelity simulators like the pilatus and the hawk simulator which i shall cover in subsequent slides the benefits are very obvious uh, in terms of the level of training as well as uh, in, in terms of reduction in actual flying effort on aircraft which is cost effective as well as enhances the actual life of the aircraft we move on to the role oriented training which is the next high level of training on simulators military simulators have have uh, have value added features for specific roles and missions such as simulation of special weapons like guided weapons tv guided weapons anti radiation weapons laser guided weapons and conventional bombs so uh, during the role oriented training the pilot will have an experience of delivery of this uh, uh, high range armament without actually uh, doing it in a real uh, world scenario also there is a training on the electronic warfare uh, features on the aircraft and the ground system and air to air refueling with a tanker aircraft moving on to the advanced training the modern simulators have capability to generate multiple threat scenarios in a networks situation so definitely the skill level and the training level gets enhanced we also have war game, gaming simulators which are capable of generating multiple threats and solutions in a theater which gives the future commanders a scope for training to exploit the systems to assess the effect of various approaches to challenges in high tech and dynamic battlefield scenario we have a class of simulators besides the flight simulators also called as the aeromedical simulators these simulators are used for operational training in aerospace uh, medicine which is called optram for pilots it is a course conducted uh, for a period of 5 days for pilots the first category of simulator uh, for uh, optram training is high performance human centrifuge which has been upgraded to dynamic flight simulator which gives essentially training for high g maneuvers in a controlled and safe environment there is the special disorientation simulator which gives the pilot practice for recovery from disorientation in flight in a controlled environment then there is a explosive decompression chamber and rapid decompression chamber which gives the pilots and the air crew training for hypoxia which is reduced oxygen and hypo barrier which is reduced altitude now i shall give you a glimpse on some of the simulators available with if firstly the latest acquisition is the rafal simulator which has been procured from messrs daso aviation in september 2016 and it has been commissioned in february 2020 the LCA Bark 1 Tejas Simulator, fully homegrown simulator, which is procured from DRDO, Aeronautical Development Agency, as a part of the The simulator was commissioned in August. That is from in the year 2009 and thereafter we went for an indigenous development of hawk simulator which is procured from HAL in the year 2010 and got commissioned in 2018. 
We have the Dornier FTD flight training device, equivalent to a FMS, as was covered in the previous slide, procured by Messrs. CAE India in the year 2007. The simulator got commissioned in October 2009 and was subsequently upgraded indigenously in the year 2018. Glimpse of aeromedical simulator is a special disorientation simulator. Quantity three were procured from Messrs. AMST Austria in the year 2003 and subsequently two in 2008. This is used for special disorientation uh, of pilots to simulate disorientation in flight and train the pilot for recovery from disorientation. The, all the simulators, all the three which were acquired, were subsequently upgraded for NVG compatibility in the year 2010. There are some simulators, all the simulators which were listed uh, earlier uh, are on the inventory of the IF. Now, there is a class of simulator which operate under the BOM concept, which is the build, operate and maintain concept. That means Simulator services are hired on an hourly basis through a vendor. The first in this class of simulator is the ALH simulator for the advanced light helicopter. It was set up by Messrs. Hatsoff, which is a joint venture between HAL and CAE. C-130J simulator, or it is, or as is commonly called as the weapon system trainer. It's a full level D simulator, FAA certified, and it was set up as a part of the offset contract for acquisition of C-130J aircraft. And it is presently being managed by Messrs. Mahindra Defense System. Another level D simulator which we have is the C-17 simulator, which was also set up under offset contract by Messrs. Boeing India Defense Private Limited. We have also acquired services under the BM concept for two Mi-17 B-5 simulators uh, at two different bases, which has been, have been set up by Messrs. Alpha Design Technologies Limited, an Indian firm, under the offset obligation. The MiG-29 upgrade simulator has also been commissioned in the year 2021, and it has been set up under the offset contract by Messrs. Alpha Design Technologies Limited. So these are the simulators which operate under the BOM concept, whereby IF hires simulator services on users' rate contracts. The other types of simulators which we have in the IF starts with the induction process, computerized pilot selection system, three of them for cognitive and psychomotor testing for candidates at Air Force selection boards for selection of candidates for induction as pilots. This simulator is also an indigenous one designed and developed by DRDO, that is Defense Institute of Psychological Research and Aeronautical Development Establishment. We also have system simulators for the Pechora, like for the Pechora surface to air guided weapon system, which has been developed in house by the IF, and also for the Akash design system, which has been supplied by Mrs. Bell. We also have air traffic control simulator, whereby we uh, we train the ATC officers and the air crew in various ATC procedures and also handling of emergencies and exigencies. This simulator has also been developed in-house by IF at an uh, institute called Software Development Institute located at Bangalore. We have a war gaming simulator at the College of Air Warfare, which has been uh, provided by Messrs. Flightline, a Bangalore-based company. So with that, we move on to how the simulators are maintained in the IF. The first and the most widely used model of maintenance of simulators in the IF is the MC model, annual maintenance contract, which in fact is a comprehensive AMC, which includes for all the spares required for maintenance of simulators for a period of three or five years, as the case may be. We demand minimum assured serviceability uh, uh, by the vendor. And however, uh, the downside is that upgrade of simulator is not part of the AMC contract. We also have gone in for in-house maintenance by IF, 
where, uh, especially in cases where we have developed it on our own, or also we have developed uh, expertise. In this case, we stock all the required spares in the IF inventory, and we also train a core team of uh, technical officers and technicians for maintenance of simulators under this category. The new and more emerging trend in simulator services is build, operate, and maintain concept under which we hire simulators, simulator services on an hourly, hourly basis under a usage rate contract. We call it URC with vendor, in which we specify the minimum guaranteed annual uses, MGAU hours, with a flexibility of 5 to 10 percent of additional hours in case of requirement. The simulators running under this category, as was brought out in one of the previous slides, is ALH Simulator by Hatsoff, which is a joint venture between HAL and CAE, a Canadian firm. C-130J Weapon System Trainer or a simulator by Mrs. Mahindra Defense System, C-17 Simulator, Mi-17, B-5 Simulators by Alpha Design Technologies Limited, and the MiG-29 Upgrade Simulator, again, by Mrs. ADTL. The future of simulator, as I consider, not surprising since I am managing simulators myself out here, is very exciting and challenging. Some of the exciting simulator projects we have in pipeline, both in terms of acquisition as well as BOM concept. The Dornier uh, D08 uh, aircraft is used for ab initio training of transport uh, aircraft pilot. So we are procuring a Dornier DO228 simulator fully upgraded from Messrs. HAL. It's a full mo missions, full motion, six axis simulator, a level D class of simulator. The design and development of this simulator has been done by Messrs. HAL in partnership with a Slovakian firm, Messrs. Virtual Reality Media. We have also gone in. Simulator for the upgraded Miras 2000 aircraft. This is coming from Mrs. Thales, France, and uh, in partner. Is the is the uh, basic trainer aircraft, which is being acquired from HL as a part of. This uh, sir, am I audible? Because I can see. Uh, yeah, uh, Rajneesh, Rajneesh, there might be a bandwidth problem for a couple of seconds you went off. So what you do is you switch off your video and keep your audio on and speak. All right, sir. Yeah, go on. Sir. So just to cover the missed points, so we are acquiring Jaguar Darin 3, the latest version of the Jaguar aircraft from Messrs. HAL, contract for which was signed about two weeks back. We're also acquiring the basic trainer aircraft, BTA, from HAL STT-40, which is again an indigenous aircraft program. And as a part of that, we are also acquiring a simulator for the same, which is in line with the MOD policy of acquiring simulator with any acquisition, which was brought out by the chairman in his opening remarks. We are also procuring two twin dome simulators, which is actually uh, simulators at two different locations and uh, networked over our own uh, Air Force network and doing combat training and whatnot. We are also working on a project on upgrade of the old Su-30 simulators, the full mission simulator, as well as the part task trainers. The next simulator which we have placed in order for is the full motion simulator, a level D uh, FAA certified simulator for the Airbus 
C295 acre uh, contract for which was signed on 23rd September 21. It includes simulator and also the infrastructure for the simulator as a part of turnkey project. This is another emerging trend in acquisition of simulator that the infrastructure is included as a part, as a turnkey project, as a part of the acquisition. However, the most exciting uh, simulator uh, which on a project on which we are working upon uh, is the air combat tactical and training simulator commonly called as ACTTS. I would call it as the mother of all simulators which is being procured under offset contract. It is built on something called live, virtual and constructive concept in a network environment. What it basically means Live is real people operating real system. That means you will have fighter aircrafts up in the air with actual pilots flying them. Network into this environment. A virtual meaning real people operating simulated systems. So a Su-30 simulator or a Mirage 2000 simulator or a Jaguar simulator would also be integrated in the ACTTS on our network. Constructive, which means a simulated people involving and operating simulated systems will also be integrated into this setup. So all three components that is live, virtual and constructive would all be integrated in the ACTTS and operate in a network environment. So it will provide the most realistic training for combat pilots uh, uh, in a real world scenario. While the field of simulators is very exciting and challenging, I'm afraid uh, it comes with its own set of challenges, but on a positive note, lots of plethora of opportunities as well. Some of the challenges we encounter in maintaining and operating the existing simulators in the IF. Firstly, pertaining to aircraft data, or the model of the aircraft, basically the, the mathematical equations which govern uh, the operation and performance of the aircraft and its handling qualities. That is a uh, IPR uh, which is generally not shared by any of the OEM. Same applies for source code and programming tools which the OEM is not willing to part with. The problem we face because of these limitations is that we are unable to introduce new features and functionality in the simulator on our own for want of this two information or data. There are obsolescence issues which we also encounter uh, basically on the graphics hardware. Uh, visualization is of full motion simulator and the CPT and the PTT we talked about is the key. Every simulation is finally shown to the pilot in terms of visualization. And uh, obsolescence issues are most prominent in graphics hardware, the workstations and the servers which generate real-time graphics image and projects in front of the pilot and the cockpit. The projectors also suffer from obsolescence issues Within five years of inducting a new simulator, uh, the OEM of the projector starts declaring that there is a new projector model available in the market and he's closing shop for the projectors which he has just supplied about six to seven years back. So we face uh, obsolescence issues on that. Of course, we also have a obsolescence management plan uh, on which we work with the vendors uh, in the industry uh, indigenously as well as abroad uh, to stock up adequate amount of spares to guard ourselves against obsolescence. Because of a combination or one of the above factors, uh, there are challenges in upgrade of simulators the moment we decide that this simulator requires an upgrade because we want additional functionality because of certain new weapons have been integrated. We face challenges uh, uh, because the aircraft performance data model and handling qualities and the source code is not available. However, uh, with uh, since the 
indigenous industry has matured to a large extent in developing software and reverse engineering uh, uh, such technologies. Uh, we are on a better footing uh, presently, I would say. With this set of challenges, it definitely provides for a plethora of opportunities for the industry to take on simulation projects with the IF and in services, uh, with the services in general. We have a lot of projects for upgrade of simulators. We are already processing a case for upgrade of the old SU-30 simulators. We have two versions of SU-30 simulators, the new ones, which are perfectly current, but the old ones we would like to upgrade to the present status. And, and likewise, there'll be many such projects for upgrade of existing simulators. Like the chairman brought out, the the spectrum of simulators for Air Force is not only flight simulation or aeromedical simulation, which was just covered, but also maintenance simulators, simulators for radar systems, guided weapon system, and so on. So the industry has opportunity to develop uh, simulators for such systems or uh, also offer them as services under the build, operate, and maintain concept. The other opportunity which the industry has is to look for uh, annual maintenance contract, comprehensive annual maintenance contract for the various types of simulators we already have in our inventory. So on this positive note, uh, uh, for the future of simulators in the IF, I conclude my presentation, I would be glad to answer your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you, sir, and Jen. Uh, thank you, Rajneesh. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very uh, good, comprehensive uh, presentation. So now uh, we will move on to speaker from uh, naval headquarter that's fine yes, uh, good evening sir sir i am uh, lieutenant commander leher singhal currently posted in uh, dnbcd directorate ihq i am here to give a presentation on ship handling and damage control simulators used in indian navy request permission to start sir yeah please uh, leher please start sir Now, the first part of the presentation will cover the damage control simulators. Naval history is filled with instances that illustrate the important role damage control has played in naval operations. A battle can be decisively won if our weapons are deadly and our platforms are resilient. And for making our platforms resilient, it is of paramount importance that our men be trained in effective damage control and have the confidence in their ability to control all but the most devastating damage. It is this realization that led to the formation of a roadmap for training officers and sailors of the Navy in damage control readiness and the setting up of the first damage control simulator at NBCD School Lonavla by Goa Shipyard Limited. Thus exposing men to realistic conditions that would exist on a warship after she has been hit in a battle. Now presently, the Indian Navy has three types of damage control simulators in use. The first is damage control simulator, which imparts training for battleship damage control scenarios in a real war-like situation to the ship's crew. It simulates wartime damages, including flooding with explosion sounds, smoke, and damage to systems occurring in a controllable rolling environment. Currently, the simulators are based at the following locations. The firefighting simulator imparts firefighting training to personnel serving on board. It is presently set up in NBCD School Lonavla and is being constructed in Kochi and Vishakhapatnam. Lastly, the NBC training facility or the Nuclear Biological Chemical Training Facility is designed so as to train naval personnel 
in realistic NBC environment. Currently, this facility is present in NBCD school Lonabla. It is noteworthy that all damage control simulators have been constructed and set up indigenously by Indian vendors, namely Goa Shipyard Limited, Joseph Leslie Dynamics, and Electro-Pneumatics and Hydraulics Limited. Now we'll discuss the three simulators in detail. DCTF or the Damage Control Simulator provides real-time situation of flooding due to damage to hull of warship in rolling seas. The DCTF is a three-deck structure with compartments akin to actual ship and supported on two end bearings, which enables the structure to roll up to 20 degrees on either side and imitate the rolling effect of the sea. Personnel are exposed to water ingress akin to flooding post damage to ship's hull under realistic sea conditions and men are trained to undertake all types of damage control. All exercises are under constant control from staff room and observation points. The various drills that are undertaken in the DCTF are as flashed. It may be noted that per year, an average of 20,000 officers and men of Indian Navy are trained every year in the three DCTF simulators. Now, this is the kind of readiness that these simulators are actually generating. Next, we move to firefighting training facility. This facility, also called Ajar, was set up at NBCD school and is one of its kind in Asia and can create conditions that would be present during an actual fire incident. It comprises of different modules similar to ship's galley, engine room, mess decks, and holodeck for providing extensive firefighting training. In this simulator, apart from fire, the trainees also experience high temperature, low visibility, smoke, sound, etc., which prepares them for prompt and effective response to onboard fires. The trainees fight fires in the most fire-prone compartments of the ship using fixed and portable firefighting equipments. Lastly, the Nuclear Biological and Chemical Training Facility houses radioactive sources and associated cutting-edge protection mechanisms to allow safe and real-time training of personnel in undertaking NBC defense. The facility is being effectively used for training of Indian Navy, Coast Guard, international trainees of navies undergoing various NBCD courses, and training visits by the personnel from Indian Army, Air Force, BAC, and NDMC. The NBC simulator is a two-deck ship-like structure for conduct of simulated nuclear, biological, and chemical drills for detection of NBC agents in hotspots, their decontamination, and training on SOPs for operating in a contaminated environment. The simulator has a full-fledged DCHQ, that is the damage control headquarters, with ship-installed radiac system and ship-installed chemical agent detection system and a cleansing and a shelter station akin to those on board ships. The various drills undertaken in the NBC simulator are as flashed. It may be noted that per year, an average of 4,500 officers and men of Indian Navy are trained in the FFTF and the NBCTF at Lonavla alone. And with the upcoming firefighting training facility in Kochi and Vishakhapatnam, we are looking at taking damage control readiness to the next level. Now, in the next Five to 10 minutes, I would deliberate on ship handling simulators being utilized to train officers and sailors of Indian Navy at various levels of their professional career. A ship handling simulator does realistic simulation of ships, submarines, harbors, and various sea conditions, which enables to train Indian Naval personnel towards aspects of bridgemanship, 
ब्रिज इमरजेंसी एंड मशीनरी ब्रेकडाउन ड्रिल्स नेविगेशनल ट्रेनिंग रूल्स ऑफ रोड डिजिटल नेविगेशन एंड ऑप्टिमम एक्सप्लोइटेशन ऑफ नेविगेशनल एड्स the ship handling simulators are utilized to hone ship handling aspects of indian navy personnel at various level of their career some of them are transit through straits and traffic separation schemes handling ships in canals rivers and narrow channels handling ships in company and undertaking fleet maneuvers simultaneously underway replenishment abeam and astern methods formation anchoring turning short on an anchor and dredging an anchor making approaches for towing operation and establishing contact with towed vessels also handling ships with help of tugs beaching operations steering from asp man overboard recovery and launch and recovery of helicopters with wind on billets the various aspects of training brought out in previous slides are being undertaken through ship handling simulators across the indian navy they are utilized to train personnel at ab initio level at ina which is the indian naval academy adimala professional level including workups at nd school kochi and command levels for fleet ships at all indian naval commands Now the ship handling simulators that are presently in service in Indian Navy can broadly be categorized into the first is the ship handling simulator or SHS capable of single bridge operation view one trainee station now this has a limitation of multi training capability the next or the most advanced version is the multi station ship handling simulator and as the name suggests they are capable of simulating four bridges simultaneously they have got four training stations and can be utilized to factor for increased training load the multi station ship handling system also offers more realistic training especially for evolutions concerning to ship handling in a company the ship handling simulators are located across the indian navy commands to cater for the training requirement at each professional level as was elucidated in the previous slides they are located at mumbai karwar edimala kochi port blair and visakhapatnam and the multi station ship handling simulators are located at nd school kochi now i would be highlighting the peculiarities of the multi station ship handling system it has a four training station that is four bridges of four ships that can interact with each other one instruction instructor station and main briefing room simulation of more than 35 types of ships and submarines simulation of 34 indian and foreign harbors and indian beaching sites 360 degree azimuthal field of view it can run in a network or isolation simulating bridges of ships operating in a company now the shs and the mss hs are capable of simulating real time conditions and roll and pitch being experienced on the ship pictorial representation of some of the events could be depicted in the subsequent slides as you can see it is capable of simulating the time of the day that is dawn dusk night and rain it also has the capability to simulate various sea conditions giving a very real time training to the men of indian navy further it can simulate various met conditions giving a real time training of varying visibility at sea lastly it has the ability to train personnel for movement in various harbors by simulating harbors of visakhapatnam port blair foreign ports etc thank you i hope the last 10 15 minutes have been educational uh, lehar thank you very much for uh, 
very good presentation. Yeah. We have learned quite a lot on this. So now, uh, are there any questions? Because now we are entering the question answer uh, session. Uh, No, sir. I've checked the chat box and Q&A box. There are none. Okay, then. Uh, so, thank you very much to both the uh, participants who have uh, delivered uh, the lectures. So, uh, we have understood the importance of simulators and also it has been highlighted that there is a large scope in simulators and the kind of activities which Navy and Air Force are doing. Uh, there will continue to be requirement of various simulators and now we can see that down to very uh, small activity also is being simulated. So that is a very good trend and uh, I think it will continue because it will save finally revenue uh, to us. The uh, points brought out by Air Force that the visual system and the terrain database etc. that is the area of concern. Industry can take a look at that. Uh, infrastructure will always be part of simulator because simulator is a very specialized device and only one or two pieces we procure. The damage control simulator is a very important thing and uh, I think other people should also look at it and uh, it can be used in a uh, lot of situations because this damage cannot be simulated, cannot be actually done in real time for training. So with this, I thank General Shivastav and I thank uh, Mr. Aurora and both the participants for uh, this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Marshal Dekshit, uh, Leher and Rajneesh. Uh, excellent presentations and I think uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, lessons that can be learned and drawn by the uh, Army as well, uh, particularly as far as the institutional way of handling various simulators like for years Air Force has been in the lead. So there are a lot of lessons to learn from how they have evolved their practices and as far as uh, what the Navy does once again is very peculiar and uh, um, particularly as far as biological incidents are concerned now I think there is good reason that every station everywhere we should have something because it's a real threat looking at us and not only in maybe one or centralized place. Um, so I think uh, uh, let me sum up for the day also now we have had a very engrossing uh, sessions and I really thank all the participants who have stayed with us for the entire day uh, I thank uh, in particular uh, General Narayanan and I thank uh, A. Marshal Tiwari who participated in the inaugural session as also um, Kan Kuber all the sessions chairs and speakers, uh, they were really, uh, I would say, uh, domain experts and they have shared with us issues that we need to think about. It was a good time, it was a good time to for everyone to get educated, like those who are dealing with this, they obviously were aware of the government uh, guidelines and policy which have just been enunciated in September. But for the others, for the other viewers, it was a good opportunity to catch up on those issues. and. Uh, for the industry and academia, I'm sure there are enough pointers uh, to get into. There are huge opportunities here, as was clearly mentioned by uh, Rajneesh and uh, and many other speakers as well. And the promise being shown by our uh, indigenous uh, uh, private industry players, that was also brought out very, very, very well by several speakers, particularly from the Air Force. Uh, inputs as regarding war gaming and the presentation by SDD. They were once again very, very peculiar. They gave a good insight into what is happening uh, in, a, in a huge range of activities as far as the army is concerned. And uh, war gaming um, was touched upon in a limited way. But it, I think at the end of the day, everybody will be moving towards the LVC, that is the live, virtual, and constructive. And a mix of all those in a particular environment and this is where the world is moving to. Uh, I'm sure those kind of systems are going to be expensive. And I guess Air Force once again would be in the lead. They've already spoken about it. So it's, it's a good time for other services also to get engaged with them. 
we did not hear much uh, about uh, in the morning had hours about the Neville Neville's uh, Arna, uh, a war gaming kind of a simulated tool inaugurated in 2019. So um, I'm sure this is something which is being exploited. I'm told in multinational exercises too, it is being exercised. So there are lessons to learn. Other services too must know about these things. Um, I will close by saying that we have heard enough about single service uh, operational environments being created. It's good time now to start thinking about joint uh, battlefield, battle space environments being created. And that's where you, you should also uh, crank it. The, the, um, you know, the, the uh, integration of the other services as well. Because we would be having amphibious uh, kind of uh, operations where all the three services are involved. Uh, it's, it's time we uh, took that step as well. So thank you so much. I, I thank all these speakers, all the chairs, and all our participants once again. And I in particular want to thank uh, uh, General Ravi Arora uh, for his you know, untiring efforts to put these events together. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, on behalf of Center for Joint Warfare Studies and Indian Military Review, it's my privilege to thank all those who made this event successful. I would like to thank Headquarters IDS and Army, Navy and Air Force Headquarters with whose support we run these events. Uh, and the, in particular, the Vice Chiefs of the three services for making the best speakers available to speak to the delegates. I'd like to thank Headquarters Army Training Command, and especially the Chief of Staff, General J.S. Sandhu, uh, who had provided uh, who had nominated the commandants of uh, Wardek and STD, who were key speakers at this event. Uh, the Commandant MCEME, General TSA Narayanan, for setting the stage with his inaugural address. Uh, and particularly the Deputy Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal uh, Tiwari, uh, who has been instrumental in helping us with many of the events in our past for having given the keynote address uh, to Captain Naval Training, Amit Sood, uh, who gave out the philosophy of naval uh, simulators in the inaugural session, to Colonel K.V. Kuber, Director, Defense and Aerospace, Ernest and Young. Uh, he has told us that the knowledge paper on military simulators is getting ready. As soon as we have it from him, the soft copy will be mailed to all those who attended and gave the, their email addresses while registering for the event. Uh, everyone will get it. To all the session chairmen, uh, the MG Doctrine R track, uh, General Chandran, Major General Ajay Ori, Major General Deepak O'Broy, ADG Artillery. And here I would like to thank uh, the DG Artillery for having nominated his best officers uh, at very short notice for the webinar to ACS Plans Air Headquarters AVM Ashutosh Dikshit for having chaired this session and all the panelists from Headquarters IDS, DRDO, uh, RT Directorate, Air Headquarters, Naval Headquarters uh, for having spared time and given uh, extremely interesting presentations to our sponsors, EDS Technologies, and our exhibitors, to all the delegates who attended from the armed forces, from paramilitary, DRDO, and industry and academia. And on behalf of Indian Military Review, I'd like to thank the team Senjos, who worked behind the scenes uh, to put things together. Uh, tomorrow, the video recording of today's proceedings will be played from 9.30 to 5.30. Uh, after we end this event, there will be a feedback form on your screens. Kindly fill it. Uh, this was the fourth edition of uh, Training and Simulators uh, event, and we will try and improve upon it in the years to come with your feedback. Thank you very much, all of you. Good day to you.